All right. Um, well, welcome everyone. As um, as we get started here, I just wanted to go through a couple um, announcements. Um, as we work towards better inclusive practices here at IBS, I have a few reminders. Uh, we will be using chat and hand raise features for clarifying questions during the presentation, but please hold other questions until the end. We have enabled subtitles and the ability to view a live transcript. If you utilize the CC button at the bottom of the screen, you can view the live transcript or turn on or off the subtitles if needed. I wanted to note that we will be recording this meeting. Actually, we are recording. I wanted to make sure that was on. Um, so we understand with that that some people might prefer to have their cameras off. Um, we also know that it is helpful for the presenters to see faces on the other end of the um, of their screen, just so it doesn't feel like they're talking into a black box, but we certainly understand whatever you need to do is, is fine. If you would like to rename yourself and include your pronouns, please do so. And if you need help with that, you can chat with me privately and I can assist. I would like to take a moment to read our land acknowledgement before we get started. Acknowledging that we reside on the homelands of indigenous peoples is an important step towards recognizing the history and the original stewards of these lands. The intent of a land acknowledgement is to extend beyond spoken or written words. It must be implemented thoughtfully and meaningfully and be reinforced by direct support and consideration of indigenous people. As we gather, we honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado's four campuses are on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, Lakota, Pueblo, and Shoshone nations. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now called Colorado. Acknowledging that we live on the homelands of indigenous peoples recognizes the original stewards of these lands and their legacies. With this land acknowledgement, we celebrate the many contributions of native peoples and also recognize the, the sophisticated and intricate knowledge systems indigenous peoples have developed in relationship to their lands. With that, I'll turn things over to Stefan, who will be introducing our speaker. Thank you so much, Cindy. And welcome everyone. It's our distinct pleasure to um, welcome Motesa Karenza Bay um, to give his talk. Um, I'm really glad that this really worked out. It's a very interesting topic and we're really looking forward. Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, it's always good to have a few people um, for these kinds of talks. And uh, a quick, uh, a very quick introduction um, for Moteza. Moteza did his Bachelor of Science in Surveying Engineering at the Shahid Rajai um, Teacher Training University in Tehran in 2008. He did his Master of Science in Geographic Information Systems Engineering at KN Tulsi University of Technology in Tehran. Um, he has a PhD, um, a Doctor of Philosophy in Geography, specialized in geographic information science from Penn State. Um, he finished that in 2018. Um, after that, he did a postdoctoral uh, postdoctoral fellowship in, at Purdue University, the Visual Analytics Center, um, with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering um, at Purdue University. He joined us in geography in 2019 as an assistant professor um, and is at the same time an affiliate faculty with um, the Department of Computer Science and Department of Information Science at um, University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, a few words on his background, um, on his research. Uh, he is a specialist in geospatial data science and spatial temporal machine learning. He did a lot of research before he came to Boulder in geographic information retrieval and visual analytics. These are also the topics that he um, spends his time teaching in geography. And uh, as you can see, Motesa comes with um, very distinct expertise and methods and methods research. He recently started to um, to um, be more interested in applications such as um, public health and COVID. And uh, as you can see in this um, title for his talk today, um, this is about short-term forecasting of COVID-19 COVID using spatial temporal machine learning, where he really tries to put his expertise together um, for these kinds of forecasting models, which actually um, caught a lot of attention recently in the media, in the news. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk, Moteza. Please take it away. Welcome. 
Well, thank you, Stefan. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Stefan. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. It's not February 4th, it's February 14th. So let's uh, get on with the corrections. <laughs> um, I, I am very privileged to be here to give an overview of our um, recent work in the past year and a half on, for, on efforts to um, forecast COVID-19 in the US, uh, mostly at the county level. Um, so I'll try to give this talk to a uh, relatively high level, but happy to delve down and go um, towards details whenever we get to the q and I'll go ahead and try to reset my timer here. There you go. Okay, let's get started. Um, so the motivating part of this talk will be short. I, I don't think I need to motivate this much. I wonder how you have felt about this whole COVID situation in the past couple of years. Uh, maybe you wanted to go on a trip and see, well, <laughs> do we do we see a hot spot in where we want to travel? Will there be a hot spot where we want to travel four weeks from now, right? But really at the, from a practical and operational point of view, you know, the COVID-19 uh, epidemics happen asynchronously, more or less, you know, so it's, sometimes it was in the Northeast, then it would move towards the Midwest um, and the central US, sometimes the West Coast. And what happened really as a result, especially early on in the pandemic, was that uh, medical resources and nurses were just being moved around. At times, states were even bidding to, you know, outbidding each other to get this equipment only to later on you know, pass it on to another state or another county because they had acquired just too many. Um, also from an uh, intervention point of view, right, if you know there will be a hot spot in a certain area, well, then you may proactively want to enforce mass mandates or um, put restrictions on public gatherings or some businesses, right? Uh, but unfortunately, most of these interventions have been more reactive and reactionary in the U.S. And hopefully by the end of this talk, we, we can circle back and see what, why that's been really the case. Um, so that's kind of the motivation, but how, how has forecasting been done in the US? Um, there are several teams around the country uh, that each Monday get together or each Sunday essentially and submit their uh, weekly forecast to this entity called COVID-19 Forecast Up, uh, hosted at UMass Amherst, Amherst um, which takes these forecasts, essentially generates an ensemble. So you hear, you'll hear me saying ensemble over and over again. It relates to that combination of all these models. Uh, essentially, it's the median of all these submissions for each quantile. These are probabilistic forecasts. And there are deaths, for, um, cases, uh, and hospitalization forecasts um, at the state and the county level. Um, and the um, death forecasts and the case forecasts are weekly, the hospitalization forecasts are daily at the moment. Um, we ended up being one of our one of these teams as of August last year. And uh, today's talk is kind of a story of how that happened. Essentially early on in the pandemic, you know, Population Council in New York generously um, co contacted us and, and we, we, we linked and we thought about hotspot pr prediction, but we really didn't move the work forward. At the time, I was thinking, well, there are many other uh, teams out there who can do this much better than us. Um, these teams that um, submit these forecasts to the hub, it's most of them, if not all, use the you know, variations of these mechanistic models, uh, compartmental models uh, called SIR that divide the populations into, into compartments of susceptible, infectious and recovered. And you have individuals essentially moving from one category, one compartment to another. And the rate of movement is governed by a system of differential equations. So I is infected as is susceptible, the more they interact, thus the multiplication by a constant that we want to calibrate and find, they move from the susceptible category to then the infected category, right? We see the same right here with a positive sign. Some of them will recover, right? Thus, this gamma multiplied by infections and move to the recovered category, right? Euphemistically, some will unfortunately pass away. Now, there are more sophisticated models as well that have more compartments, uh, but this is really the core of compartmental models. Some have also the exposed category, sometimes provide uh, a quarantine category. Um, 
initially these models were not performing all that well. The, the data was new, the virus was new, you know, the pathogen was new. But then even later on, as people went in and realized, oh, really adding more compartments isn't helping all that much. Again, th this is such a blanket statement, but if you look at more recent papers and the fits that epidemiolo epidemiologists have done, um, you see that uh, you know more sophisticated models didn't necessarily perform well. But really early on, and even right now, I want to argue these models have strengths that are not necessarily their forecasting skill. Right? So there are newer generations of data-driven models with their uh, own disadvantages um, that uh, take advantage of machine learning algorithms or spatial temporal variance. And that is the topic of my talk today and what we did essentially looking at historical patterns of data um, from uh, temporal lags to spatial lags to uh, sociodemographics, socioeconomics of each spatial unit, each county, each state can we do uh, forecasting up to four weeks of what our cases will be, let's say, in each county. Uh, what I'm about to present here was published in Nature Communications. Um, Late last year, it was several months in the work, but uh, the title is Spatial Temporal Prediction of COVID-19 Using Inter and Intra-County Proxies of Human Interactions. And this inner county is something that is really, really interesting. Um, and you know, the results were kind of surprising even to me. So the idea really was to replicate this process with the data that you have until, uh, up to each Monday forecast COVID-19 in each county in the US in the, in the one week ahead horizon, two weeks, three weeks, up to four weeks ahead. And the data is obviously all the data that you could observe or collect by that um, Sunday so that you could submit your forecast on Monday. Initially, I wanted to essentially look at a few comparisons. I wanted, I wanted the model to be more or less interpretable to see, well, does including spatial lags or spatial dependence terms help with the model fit? Um, but another design choice that we made was, well, if you're using machine learning, uh, especially techniques that are relatively powerful in capturing nonlinearities in our data, then let's fit it just a global model. And the idea is that the variations, spatial temporal variations should be picked up by the model, at least to, to a good extent, um, using this inter and intra county or spatial unit features. So with that, we set up several algorithms, but we ended up going with um, ex extreme uh, gradient boosted trees, XGBoost. Uh, essentially, it's a variation of the random forest. Like you could think about it. It's not in parallel. It does the corrections on the residuals of each tree and provides nonlinearity and prediction. So we used it for regression, obviously. Um, on the rather boring side, the features that these models use were some of them were restricted to each county um, on its own. So we, we call that intra-county you know, features. Essentially, if I'm doing prediction at the Boulder County, well, what data from Boulder County itself can I use? All sorts of sociodemographics and, um, uh, and uh, other perhaps, you know, uh, partisan affiliation that we saw in the literature could be helpful and, and kind of determines people's behavior or their susceptibility, we included those. As well as temperature, especially at the time there, there was evidence that um, uh, you know, COVID transmission did have a relationship with um, temperature. I I'm not entirely sure what the studies say now. I haven't looked into it recently, but more importantly, is just temporal lags or historical trends of COVID-19. Well, if you saw 400 cases last week and 300 cases the week before then, well, then you can kind of guess you may have higher numbers of cases, let's say 450, 500, you name it, this week, right? In temporal lags of one week, two week, three week, and four week, right? So this is rather the simple and boring part, but what I was especially interested in as a geographer was, well, can we include the spatial lags and the spatial dependence in prediction, whether that will be um, predictive, especially when you have enough data, when you have rich data and you have temporal lags and spatial lags, most of the time temporal lags trump the inclusion of spatial lags. There's just enough information in temporal dependence and temporal logic correlation that spatial lags may not help all that much in prediction. Again, blanket statement, but 
out of the literature and, and most experiments out there. So how do I capture how the counties around us, around Boulder, are influencing our infection rates. If someone gets sick in Denver County, in Broomfield County, right, they may uh, bring cases here and vice versa. We wanted to go beyond just spatial adjacency, right? We just didn't want to look into the next door neighbor, but look at connectedness. And we looked at two proxies. One was human movement between the units. So there was this safe graph social distancing data set that would essentially measure how many people were moving between these counties um, on a daily basis from and to each county. I, at the time, thought, well, this is a great data set. It's daily. We have a panel of cell phones anonymized, and that's what SafeGraph is essentially measuring, how many cell phones are moving between these units. And then there's another static data set called social media connectedness. This was generated by Facebook, obviously named Meta uh, right now that looks at the proportion of friends in each county pair and then divides that essentially by the total of user base in those counties. Well, among all these users in these two counties in this pair, how many are them, of them are friends? That provides the strength of um, the connectedness between those counties. And what you, have, what you see here is essentially the visualization of all the counties that are connected to Denver and the color shades, the hue is showing, uh, the brightness actually is showing the strength of connection to Denver. So it's not just spatial adjacency, it goes beyond that. And again, at the time, this was more of an experiment. I thought, okay, this is worth giving it a shot. Obviously this is gonna work much, much better. Um, and I was very skeptical of this whole Facebook data set, but it had properties that were worth a shot. But interestingly enough, I, I, as you see in a few slides, I was proven wrong in my, uh, in my judgment. But how do we include this spatial lag? And the idea is relatively simple, inspired by um, spatial statistical modeling. What I have here on the slide is the spatial lag model. The, the idea is your target variable, let's say the COVID cases or hospitalizations, is not just a function of a bunch of features or predictors, but also the spatial lag of COVID infections in other counties, right? So you have an adjacency matrix that says which units are connected to the county for which you want it or the state you want to do forecasting for. And then that term has its own coefficient. Essentially what happens here is spatial lag is a weighted average of your target variable in the connected spatial units, as simple as that. And we include these in spatial statistical modeling to then be able to control for spatial dependence, right? Because it kind of, it violates the idea of independent observations for your linear model. So the idea is similar, but with a few differences. First of all, we are not using a linear model. We are, we are, we are using extreme gradient boosted trees after trying several models and realizing this one was working the best. Second is, we are not just using a binary adjacency matrix. We are in fact looking at the strength of connections of county pairs beyond the ones that are just neighbors, right? So two different proxies. One is flow based on um, the number of people that are moving between these counties, right? Uh, and we just take a weekly average for those. And then we take a weighted average of the cases in the connected counties by that strength of connection. That's, that's all it is. So calculate the spatial lag um, using a weighted average of how many new cases or hospitalizations for that matter you are seeing in um, the connected counties. So that is a safe graph cell phone mobility driven data. And we also calculated the same using Facebook social connectedness index. So take the weighted average this time based on how connected those counties are according to how many people on social media between those counties are friends. Now that we have this, we can do this for different time periods, last week, the week before last, and so on. So up to four temporal uh, lags is what we included in the model. And surprisingly enough, this, this worked this work better across the board, the social proximity to cases, and, and we can discuss as to, as to why, but um, I just want to go back and explain the inter-county features that we included in the machine learning model, right? So some of them were in one run, we had these uh, 
features derived from Facebook, right? Spatial lag for different temporal lags, as well as another model that used the safe graph features um, that were cell phone mobility driven data for different temporal lags. And we ran the model and we did comparisons. And uh, you know, I can show you lots of charts and numbers here, but really the, the message is, first of all, including the spatial features. The spatial lags did help with prediction. It helped reduce the error. So what we are looking at here is the mean absolute error of new case predictions at the county level or new case per 10K prediction rates, right? At the county level. And in both cases, including um, spatial lags, helped reducing, um, we helps with reducing those errors, whether we use Facebook or SafeGraph data. But importantly enough, especially as we repeated these experiments, the Facebook derived features um, were more helpful. They, they reduced the errors even more. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, are we are repeating these experiments with hospitalizations. I'll circle back to this at the end of my talk and we still see very good results, especially that this is not available anymore. SafeGraph shut down their social distancing data set. I believe in April and when, they, when vaccines became available and they said, ah, the pandemic's over. There are other proxies that you can use indirectly to generate these, but, but with difficulty. But we kept the model as a tree, right? So we can actually extract feature importance. And feature importance is not much by saying, well, you have a decision tree essentially at each stage and you're doing splits. Um, the split can be based on temporal lag or spatial lag or temperature, right? Because these are ensemble methods and, and you have, uh, essentially a lot of trees made, well, how many times was that particular feature used first to reduce the standard deviation in your target? So it gives you a measure of feature importance. It's not quite the same as a coefficient in a linear model, but it will help you understand the relative importance of features in your model. And what's really interesting here is that not a whole lot of features were all that important. But obviously how many cases you had last week was the most important one, right? That this is the importance level that is measured here. So temporal lag of last week was the most important, but surprisingly enough in the Facebook model, the spatial lag for last week was then next. So this is the same chart, but just zoomed in after we dropped the temporal lag of T minus one, just so that you could do better comparison. And, and I think this is, this is noteworthy because look, you would think again in temporal time forecasting that looking just at the temporal lags of your own county, which essentially is what an SIR model kind of does, is more important than seeing what the counties around you are doing. But whereas this model clearly shows, you no, know, if you could actually look at the interactions and bring in those interactions from other counties in your calculations, uh, then, uh, then, then it, it in fact will be the second most important feature in your modeling. And, you know, all sorts of features that we had, how many people were social distancing, you know, movement per day, et cetera, were not nearly as helpful. This is also another essentially visualization, table visualization of the same results. If you look at the Facebook driven model, the second most, these are the ranks of the spatial lag for T minus one. And you see that T minus one spatial lag was the second most important feature across the board for the whole evaluation period for the alpha um, surge, right? So this is where the alpha surge started. This is where it peaks. This is where it subsides. Whereas if you use safe graph and cell phone mobility data, we see that the feature is, you know, sometimes second most, but most of the time not. And, and number of second ranks is much, much lower than Facebook. So, Let's do a preliminary conclusion here. And, and well, are the social media connectedness features better? Is Facebook better than cell phone mobility? Maybe this is how our results turn out uh, with our model, with all features, with our design. Maybe someone else designs it differently and uh, things turn out differently, but you know, worth an experiment. We, I haven't seen any comparison about ours, at least so far. Um, more importantly, you know, when we, if I just showed you point predictions, well, when we look at the confidence intervals, they overlap a whole lot. So, you know, there is there was not a significant difference after everything was set up and run, right? We are not talking about one specific feature, right? Every feature and the model optimization, etc. cetera, the uh, forecasts were overlapping in terms of their confidence um, prediction interval. 
Um, but again, the SafeGraph social distancing data set is shut down. You have to use their other products to kind of by proxy reach a measure of how many people are moving between different states. That's not an easy task or between different counties at this point with the new data set. And at the same time, this Facebook data is available for 35 counties, at least the last time I checked. And uh, folks at Facebook Data for Good, it's called Meta for Data for Good now, are really uh, helpful if you want to get this data for other countries. So that's another advantage. The, safe, the cell phone data is, is, is a difficult one to come by for other countries if you're working in those regions. So, okay, spatial lag, helpful, but how good are these models? So we did some comparisons against the forecast submissions. Remember when I mentioned how the forecasting is done in the US, multiple teams are doing the submissions. And surprisingly enough, we realized, oh, in the longer term forecasts, our models were actually improving the results. We had less error and better predictions, right? So again, we are looking at the alpha, um, excuse me, we have the, this is the evaluation period, right? Now we are only looking at the alpha period here. Um, and we see that the model is performing more or less better across the board. So that's where we figured out, okay, th this is worth investing our time in and taking it further. I was still a little shocked and surprised that you know, one model, um, machine learning model, should not walk in and kind of beat an ensemble of multiple uh, epidemiological models submitted to the forecast hub. So that's when our postdocs join our team uh, and really picking up uh, Dr. Lucas, uh, picking up our uh, graduate student, Benjamin, uh, sorry, Bezad's work. And we, we thought, okay, let's use deep learning models that are specialized for time series forecasting and a variation of recurrent neural nets uh, that is you know, kind of the state of the art for time series forecasting uh, in different application domains. It's called long short-term memory networks, LSTM. The big idea behind it is that, okay, for at each time step, if you want to do prediction, why, why would we do this separately, a lot a hidden state through a set of matrix operations preserve what information is important from the previous time step to then predict the current time step as well as into the future. So that's kind of a high level, I don't know, 15 second overview of LSTMs. And it's done using a set of matrix operations within each LSTM cell. Essentially it has an input gate, a forget gate and an output gate. The forget gate forgets the information that is not super helpful in making predictions. Um, so we repeated this work. This time we know what our good features were and we didn't do a comparison of SafeGraph, Facebook, et cetera. And we ran, we built an LSTM model. And again, surprisingly enough, it just during the alpha period where we were you know, writing and publishing this paper, it just outperformed almost all models, I want to say, at, at anything that we tried that was submitted on, to the hub. Um, during the two and three and four week uh, horizons with less error, mean absolute error, right? As well as the COVID hub ensemble. So ensemble, reminder, is the best of all words. In COVID hub forecast studies, no model consistently beats the ensemble, right? So the, their study is coming out in, in the summer and we are going into submitting late in the summer after we realize, oh, these models can be actually quite helpful. Now, why this one week forecast is not as good, similar to what we did with the tree-based model during the alpha period, I, I want to talk about this. So let's kind of archive that for a second, but I want you to pay attention to these dips. And I wonder if you think these are natural, right? You had a little dips one week and then another week, what's happening there? And that's kind of what's really uh, confusing our models and therefore our results are uh, a little poor, but let's set that to the side. Um, another visualization of our results, what you're seeing, the lines show error. So lower lines are better. The red line is our model compared to uh, the COVID baseline, as well as the COVID hub ensemble, as well as the model that Facebook false generated, Facebook AI team. This has nothing to do with the Facebook data set that we use. There's a separate team at Facebook that is generating these COVID for, uh, forecasts and submitting to the hub as another model, right? Uh, the teams include 
universities and organizations, UMass Amherst, Carnegie Mellon University, Google and Harvard, Facebook, etc. So these are big teams and um, we are privileged to be one of them now and contributing to these uh, uh, forecasts. The message is, okay, for the one week forecast, uh, hit and miss, sometimes we are better, sometimes other models are better. For the two, three, and four week forecasts, we are better most of the time, other than a couple of weeks. And if you look closely at those dates, you realize, oh, those are right after Thanksgiving or Christmas and uh, New Year's and something's happening there. So I'll break that down. All right, we are writing this paper. Results are looking good. At the same time, folks running the COVID forecast hub submit this um, blog post to forecasters.org. Um, and they go into analyzing, well, how could be, were these forecasts? How reliable were they, right? We are having all these teams around the country submit their forecasts. And we, uh, we, we, we are not really seeing the results we want, especially for cases. Cases are the hardest to predict among cases, hospitalization and deaths. And what this figure that they made, you can access it on this link, is essentially meant to communicate is when we want the models to perform, they don't, right? When we see an uptick in cases, this is the confidence interval of what the models are telling us the cases would look like. This is what happened in reality. The same when the surge is kind of reaching its peak, this is what the models will tell us will happen in the next four weeks, but in reality, the cases drop. And that same thing happens over all peaks. So essentially forecasting cases was quite challenging. Um, and this is at the same time when we are like, should we submit to the hub, should we not? We don't have that much, you know, we don't have funding or support, but these models are performing well. Um, at the time, Population Council was generously starting to fund us um, to, to help move this project forward but the funding hadn't come through yet. So I went back and looked at our prediction in the roles and I realized, oh, most of the time, especially with populist counties, we are capturing the observed values within the prediction in the roles, right? Los Angeles County, uh, Philadelphia County, you name it. Every time there was a peak, most of the time, right? Our model uh, that our predictions, the red line and observed are more or less following the same path. But more importantly, we are capturing the observed that what happened in reality with our, predict with our prediction in the role. So that was kind of a motivation. We said, okay, let's go ahead and submit. So we went in and, uh, you know, Benjamin uh, Lucas, our postdoc, really took the lead in formatting all this uh, and automating the process so that every Monday we would have submissions to the hub. So if you go and look at CDC's website and forecast, you see CU Boulder's name, and that is our team, thanks to um, Bezad and Benjamin's efforts. You may be asking, wait a second, you're running deep learning and you're showing me prediction intervals. How, how, how is that? Especially if you've dealt with TensorFlow or PyTorch libraries and you know that, you know, you're minimizing essentially a mean absolute error or mean squared error loss, but where is this band coming from? Well, if you essentially switch your loss function to a quantile regression loss function and tweak your deep neural networks, you know, final layer essentially, the, to a multi-head um, layer. Uh, if you use this function, you are essentially optimizing on quantiles without having ground truth data on quantiles, if that makes sense. For case forecast, the hub wants you to submit seven quantiles, so a probabilistic distribution for each county. And for um, hospitalizations, I think 23 quantiles. And with just one run of your network, you get all of those. We run the network multiple times because deep learning is um, stochastic and we want to reduce that stochasticity. Essentially, we take the median of all runs to make sure that sometimes, you know, something with our loss function doesn't go wrong. Uh, but anyhow, the message is, and I'll be happy to explain this more, you could uh, generate quantiles, not just a point estimate, not just a mean estimate uh, using deep learning. All right. So I mentioned our first week predictions were not as good. And this, this was really interesting. And, and we thought, okay, we should look at this more closely. And why, why is that? And there is a whole lot of conversations going on at the, you know, how folks and the CDC folks as to, well, should we use the reporting date or should we use the testing date? We don't really have the data for testing date. So it's at the end of the day reporting. But what I invite you to look at, these are just two sample weeks and you pick any week, you will most likely see something like this. On the left, you see the cases. 
uh, in the country, right? So October, uh, towards the end of October in 2020, when the Midwest and Central US are seeing an explosive surge, right? And you start noticing that there are some states that are standing out, right? Even though we are looking at county level data. Now we are looking at prediction errors on the right column, right? So the under predictions are um, in purple, over predictions are in brown, if I'm reading the uh, legend correctly. But this is essentially the difference of what we predicted and what in fact had happened in reality. And all of a sudden you see these states standing out, Georgia, right? Um, but what's interesting from one week to another, you go from under predicting to over predicting. So what happened there? That the reverse is the case with Kentucky. You don't really see Kentucky in the case maps here at all. So it's not standing out, but in the prediction errors, it is. So it's flipping patterns from into, uh, uh, under to over prediction. The same with Texas, more or less. And what this really is, is when you have under reporting in one week, you will have over reporting the week follow up. And the model simply, you know, it's an unfair expectation from the model to make up for a human error. And unfortunately, that's how the model is set up by with the forecast up and CDC folks. Their rationale at the time was, okay, we are looking at a weekly forecast target, right? So what is the difference if we smoothed it or not? So here I'm showing you a time series of deaths up to yesterday and cases in the US. And you see that there is a smooth line. This red line is showing you the seven day smooth average. And that is a reasonable target to make predictions. But look at all these dips, especially for deaths, right? When deaths happen, go through certification, there will be a while before they are reported. And they come in certain, they come in essentially batches. Cases, not as much, but still similar. All those dips that you see on more, most of them are weekends, but holidays as well. Our prediction horizon and what we forecasted included Thanksgiving, included Christmas, included New Year's. And essentially all those weeks had severe underreporting followed by severe overreporting. Um, the hub folks thought, okay, if you're doing weekly forecasts, what does, why does it matter to do seven days smooth average? Well, it does, because again, what doesn't get reported in one week gets reported in the week after, even though if you're not doing daily forecasts. And, you know, as, as a little fun experiment, if we had tried to predict the smooth version and evaluated the model based on that, right, um, we, we do train based on the smooth data anyways, but the evaluation, we use essentially the target that hub folks have um, decided we should. We see that our errors drop. Um, so something that would be interesting is that had we used the smooth target to then do the comparisons, would we, would we perform better than other models? We just didn't do it because we know they are not set up to predict this target. So they didn't want to set up an unfair comparison. I'm getting close to the end of my talk, 31 minutes in, but we started a little late. So is it all a fluke? Is it all a black box? What's happening? Um, what I'm showing you here now is hospitalization forecast. There's a, little, a couple of differences. One is that hospitalization forecast in the US, at least for COVID, is on a daily basis. So you want to have 28 days out forecasts each Monday and at the state level, right? So not weekly, but daily basis. And we set up a more or less similar model, but we instead uh, and this is very Zhang Ying Wang, our, our new PhD student comes in and he's really been moving this forward is we, we, we switched to rates. We realized, oh, if we use rates, we're just getting better results. We had started with rates, we moved away to incidence and now we are back to incidence rate. Essentially normalization by population and each space and spatial level. And we see that, okay, if we only use an auto regressive model hospi on hospitalization and cases, the error isn't too bad, but if we add that social proximity to hospitalization, capture that spatial lag, the errors drop significantly. Um, so that's the orange line. But if we add the spatial lag of cases for hospitalization, our, our results don't improve all that much. Maybe yes, maybe no, it's relatively random. Nevertheless, introducing the spatial lag in the spatial temporal task within this kind of network architecture really does help. Um, so it's no fluke with the cases, it's holding up with hospitalizations as well, this is daily, and this is a completely different target, and you know the way your reporting is done not, is not quite the same. 
And here I'm, you know, the LSTM version three is our model and with the spatial features, obviously, that are handcrafted, manually engineered. And you see that they have less error day one through 14 um, because we have to predict for 28 days compared to uh, the trained ensemble and ensemble that is the forecast of. These are the models that, again, the CDC uses in reporting and communication. Now, whether they are used by local and public officials for planning is a completely different question because, you know, as we showed, they were not quite that reliable. So that's a nice field study if someone wants to undertake that. I'm not really showing you our recent results that came out this weekend. They are just too good <laughs> to be true, at least to me. We evaluated on the Delta and Omicron waves. Um, and the, the amount of improvement we are getting on Omicron is just something that have is making me think, and I want to look at the results again. But the interesting result is that the, the, the amount of improvement during the Omicron surge is even better than other surges. It might just be that other models were not performing as well during the Omicron surge. Who knows? Uh, nevertheless, it's working. Um, going to do a quick wrap up. Um, so I started with SIR compartmental models and then said, okay, we're doing deep learning with this handcrafted engineers. A little bit of discussion would be nice here. So deep learning does provide more skillful forecasts. And this is not just my study. There are multiple papers out there. Not all of them made it to the CDC and COVID forecast of submission, um, perhaps for the quantile or the logistical work that it does take to do those weekly submissions. Uh, you know, you, you're running a computer for 10 hours and then formatting and every time quality control, right? So maybe that, but papers do show that they, they are better skillful at forecasting. Um, and they are nicely automated and they incrementally update with new data as opposed to an SIR model, right? So part of these calls and conversations we have if someone's running an SIR model is like, okay, what, what number should I plug in? How contagious is disease? And, and update the models now for the new Omicron surge and so on. Whereas if you set up your deep learning properly, that technically this should update itself. Now, how much data does it need to update? Uh, how overtrained and more recent data we should do, how many epochs we should do to fit the model to the new regime of a new variant is a valid research question. But comparison between these two models during a new variant is outstanding. Uh, disadvantages, well, you are missing those explainable parameters that SIR has, right? We trust this um, SIR because people have been using it for decades and we understand it. We know what the reproduct, uh, reproductive rate is, right? For every, uh, for one infected person, if they walk into the room and no one's infected, how likely it is that, you know, how many people will walk out infected, right? We don't get that with deep learning. And as a result, we don't get this kind of prediction on well, what, what is what is the regime going to be like? Is this going to be an endemic? Will it die down? Will it infect everyone? Um, and uh, what are the specific effects of this and that intervention? If we had people do mask ma uh, wearing or um, restrictions on businesses, I'm going to argue, however, is that even with SIRs, we were not really able to answer these questions when we needed to. Right, so. When, when we need to do forecasting, well, these models show promise, but when we need to do inference and you know, inform policy, most of this has been, okay, these schools didn't have mask mandates. We can see how many kids got sick and those schools had masks. So it's not really the SIR model that is helping us at the moment with a new pathogen. That's that's kind of my argument. Um, that being said, I still um, value and I think it's important to have that interpretability and, you know, a good area of research is really combining these two. One real weird result is that these started very complicated, but have been just trimming and chopping off. Sociodemographics don't help all that much when you have <laughs> spatial temporal lags and, and autoregressive models, especially at the state level. Um, we, we, we do not see any reasonable improvement, at least in our model setup, right? To include, let's say, percent Hispanic or percent African American in our forecasts. Um, but again, outstanding research question. And where we want to take this next, you know, we are really interested in graph neural networks. Um, the idea really is why are we 
programming these weighted averages in our forecast manually? What, what, why don't we give it some initial value, but let the network adjust, right? How, what the strength of connections between these counties are, or uh, how much of yesterday's data it should use, right? So LSTMs and temporal time series forecasts do the temporal part, but not the spatial part. Spatial part, we kind of hard coded that. Getting this to work and beating what we have right now is kind of a task that we are trying to work on. And, and so far, we haven't had success. We do want to try and see if funding becomes available. We do death forecasts. We want to explore transfer learning. Um, can we pick up a spatial model that is you know, trained on uh, COVID? And how much data from flu does it get to update it? Does it work better if you had started with initial initialization from COVID? This is a very controversial opinion because the diseases are different, population parameters and immunity is different. But again, the whole idea is where do we start? How do we update? We are not saying the same model will work. There is learning in and updating there involved. And there are other ideas that we would love to explore, but I think I'm going to wrap up here. I want to thank my team because, you know, I provided a very high level talk, rather simple, but there's been lots of coding evaluations, quality control. Dr. Lucas, uh, our postdoc here, Bezad Bahadi, our PhD student here, Zhang Ying Wan, our PhD student here, and we've been collaborating with Population Council on this, Hamid Azor again, who's a CU Geography alum actually, uh, working with Stefan before I even joined. Um, and part of this work was funded by Population Council and a little bit of funding, summer funding for Bezad uh, last year through a CUPC summer GRA grant. So I want to thank everyone for their attention and I would love to hear your feedback, criticism and questions. Thank you so much, Moteza. Very interesting, very, very impressive, um, these, these kinds of outcomes and model runs. I'm sure there are there are questions. We don't have that much time, but um, let's let's see um, and spend some minutes on questions that might come up now. Um, I have a really general question. <laughs> yes, Emily, please. Um, so is there a key message about this topic that you guys think it's important for the CU student population to know? That for the CU student population. <laughs> I, 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 there's a couple of messages. One is, I think, um, one is, I think, on the fertility of this area of research if students are interested in getting involved and doing research and improve the modeling, that there is a lot of potential. And, and this COVID pandemic for all these problems that we had has given us so much data that we've almost never had. Um, so there is a good test bed that is provided for research and education. That's one message. The other message, I think, is just that uh, going that extra mile of, you know, doing research and publishing is all fun, but um, going that extra mile and submitting to national efforts has been really gratifying. And uh, I want to encourage um, so many talented folks around here to, to consider that. Well, thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, Leon, please go ahead. <laughs> it's very impressive and interesting. Uh, I just have two questions uh, about like your arrow uh, flipping uh, at the st state level. It seems like there is a clustering at the state level. Uh, I wonder, do you have any information about like such as the the government government briefing or? Um, those kind of information, which may be helpful. So, sorry, the it's a, like news. Well, whether they uh, whether the government host a con like a press conference or those kind of thing. Another thing that uh, another question is about the dropping that I'm thinking. Uh, do you control for the holiday, or do you have the information of air? Play information that the traveler traveler information. 
uh, traveler information. Did I hear that right? Yeah, like people, how, how, how often, like how many people are traveling yeah. during that time? No. Yeah. yeah. So first part of your question about with the press. So the way these forecasts work is when the hub publishes them, um, the, the CDC's website picks them up actually and publishes the results as well uh, for county, state, and um, uh, and national levels. But there is always a disclaimer on CDC's website saying this doesn't reflect CDC's view, rightfully yeah. so, especially that the models are not reliable after all. And that's why I think research is justified. Um, I don't know if we, a lot of our forecasting, so to speak. So, so what is a forecast, right? If the conditions are just like that now, what will happen in the next few weeks, right? But then we have interventions. Our projections partially come from seeing what happens in other, other countries as well. So that, that's, for instance, what happened with the Omicron surge, right? We look and see, okay, there's this rapid increase in cases and declines. We make an educated guess that that's what's gonna happen in the US. So those are more long-term broad, what will happen in the country, but where in the country will that, where will that happen is, is kind of the question that we are trying to answer using these questions, as these models. As of uh, travelers, uh, so the safe graph movement data does capture that. We did not see it improving the overall results um, yeah. in, in the model. That's at least with our kind of model. Great, thanks. Thank you. And I see something in chat, which is relatively long, so I'm going to try and read this. All right, uh, James, thanks for the question. And I've been meaning to talk to you forever about this. Um, yes, um, so the question is how, what evaluation did we use? What are the effects of noise? What are the effects of backfill? So one by one evaluation, Johns Hopkins data um, is what we used. And like I said, they don't smooth it. Uh, sorry, the, then the CDC takes it and generates ground truth uh, uh, data sets that are available on the forecast hub. Actually, that's the benchmark. Um, they're not smooth, they are backfilled. Um, so you're right, the evaluations that we did put on the paper might have taken advantage of those backfills. We don't know, there is not quite a good log of that. Nevertheless, this much improvement, um, I doubt it's for any single backfill or one state or two backfills. The other part of your question, oh, and I want to say the train ensemble, what the hub folks do is actually, uh, they score the models based on their performance in the previous 12 weeks. And, you know, in their everyone's level, everyone's using the same data on a weekly basis. And for a good while, our model was the best county level model, right? So even in their score, so that was not my evaluations until Omicron hit. And I think something went wrong with our cases forecasts and, we were kind of late to fix it. Um, but before that, we were consistently number one or two on the hub. Uh, so that makes me, you know, that gives me a little more confidence that these models perform well. As for noise, I mean, all this data is noisy. And I, I always tell my team, this is the best you can get, um, especially because there's a pandemic, hospitals are mandated to report. These mandates will go away. And really the question is how much does machine learning absorb? How much of this noise does it absorb? How much of it goes into predictions, right? We are doing regularization. We are doing all sorts of techniques in ML to try and not overfit to the data. And the forecasts are done into the future. So I, the likelihood of overfitting is very unlikely um, because all these tests that I'm showing is as a complete unseen data in the future. Um, that being said, again, these models can fail. And how, how, how do we update them for the next variant, for the next disease? And there is lots that, that is to be said there. I wonder if I, um, case data fell apart even worse with Omicron. Yep, as Jimmy's saying that. <laughs> I, I really don't know why, but our models ranking went down when Omicron hit. The hospitalization uh, forecasts are really, really good during the Omicron, but we weren't submitting those to the hub at the time. 
we are hoping to submit as of this week because it looks like hospitalizations are going to be high for quite a while. Um, Guofeng's asking, there's so many factors affecting the cases, mass mandate shutdown, do you think they can help your model? That's a great question. So when, yes, maybe, who knows, but we are capturing those in the spatial temporal lags, right? So if your county, let's say, you know, what, what is mass mandate good for? Hopefully reducing transmission. Hopefully you will have fewer cases this week. And if you have fewer cases, this week, the model is looking at that and updating itself for the next prediction. So by proxy, we are measuring that because that data is just not available on a weekly basis. Who's masking up, who's not. We, have, we had social distancing data since they went away. Even the social distancing data since weren't all that helpful when we, when we have the autoregressive effect. Um, but I really appreciate the question and I would love to, especially Jimmy, <laughs> for you to tear apart these models and tell us what you're doing wrong and how we can improve these. As said Jimmy Guofeng, as well as Jimmy, everyone really. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are there are lots of questions and, and lots of material for discussions. As you know, Montez, we, we have to talk about some of these things as well. Um, these are really interesting results and uh, I'm, I'm sure there are more questions, but uh, I, I think we are running out of time um, for today. Um, I want to thank Motesa for this really interesting talk. Again, I'm sure this, this has already ignited lots of questions in, in, in potential future discussions that people want to initiate with you, Motesa. Um, and uh, I'm really happy we, we managed to get you on here so early in February and talk about this with our ongoing research, which is very impressive and very successful. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, I don't know, Cindy, do you have any, any other announcements to make before we close? No, you're good. I mean, I, I think we have like two more minutes. Fernando, do you have anything? I know you actually had your hand raised for a little bit there. I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask more on my question because uh, otherwise we'll, we'll, we're going to go uh, above time. Thank you. Um, just a reminder that next week, oops, sorry for the noise. Uh, next week, we have Jenny Imich um, speaking on human environmental exchange in the landscapes of medieval Ireland. Um, uh, followed by a, a talk by David Cook Martin on um, um, uh, guest worker migrations, uh, which is also related to population uh, for those of you who are in CUPC, but uh, Jenny's uh, relates to, to population as well. So I hope you can join us. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you all. Have a good rest of your week. <laughs>